just when the United States is gradually pulling out of Vietnam, there is a rush of concern that Laos may become another Vietnam. Laos, America's not-so-secret war in Asia. In order to avoid uh, Laos falling under communist domination. Over nine years, 1964 to 1973, the United States dropped more than two million tons of bombs here in Laos. More than we dropped on Germany and Japan combined during all of World War II. And its objective is nothing less than taking over the, the people of the Antion and Laos have been described as the least urgent souls on earth. We made Laos per person the most heavily bombed country in history. On with national embarrassment as a confession of human bankruptcy. The priority in Laos has been to try to interdict the heavy flow of Hanoi's men and material down the U.S. bombing and reach the Mekong River. As a result, Laos is clearing more bombs, fewer Laotians are being hurt or killed, and together we are saving lives. But there is still much more work to do. seeing I'm mainly working as a trauma surgeon here sometimes all the general surgery but main injuries we see is motorbike accidents they all have the little scooters they're cheap they're giving handed out from Chinese companies for like $300 on a deposit of $5 so everybody can basically get one they all drive around like crazy they get mao mao means they get drunk a lot and they never wear a helmet or shoes or anything so flip-flops mostly so we see a lot of trauma, heart trauma, a lot of soft tissue trauma, more of that than in Europe, and a lot of fractures. Do you have a vision that I'm working here? I don't have a vision. I just enjoy working here. I enjoy having a purpose, and I enjoy learning from the doctors. I enjoy messing around with my poor Lao. I enjoy having fun with them and meeting them outside of work. and. I enjoy learning from them. I mean, sometimes they will tell me, you know, I have this patient, he has this and that, and I wonder, and I don't know. And then they say, it's dengue fever. And I'm like, oh, right, dengue fever. Never seen that before. <laughs> and I think it's great. So I, yeah, I learn a lot. It's a lot of fun. I don't think I will change this country. I don't think I will change the medical system here. So I may help two or three patients while I'm here and that feels totally fine. I think there must be something wrong with his brains. He's pretty much like the other one we saw at four years of age who didn't move and his mother was carrying him around all the time. I'm, I'm kind of afraid this is happening. This is the same that we're experiencing here because there are no reflexes. He has no tension whatsoever. And when I put him on the stomach, he has a very hard time to lift his head. But it's a child of five months old. He should be able to do this even if he is sick with meningitis especially after three days of treatment, he should be better by now. So I'm not sure whether there isn't another cause underlying this that's actually causing his inability to move.
pain in the ass if you're in a jungle boat thing by yourself and you lose the wrench. Happened to me a couple of times in Tam Nam Tem. You just need to go down. Oh, all those questions I have to think back on. Um, when did we come here for the first time? In 2000 and four, maybe, or five, something like that. Um, I had just met Volker and I was trying to impress him, trying to be this woman that he would want to marry. <laughs> and uh, so I said, I really always wanted to bolt a multiple pitch line. And he's like, yeah, that's what I want to do. And then he took me along on a trip to here. Most of the routes here I bolted by lead climbing by myself, soloing. That also means you're always sitting in your bolt first before you tighten it. Gives you some extra scare. I'd never been to Southeast Asia or Asia or, you know, I mean, the States was the farthest I'd been. And um, so we ended up coming to Wang Deng and um, endeavoring on this multiple pit route which I probably put in one single bolt and he put in the other hundred. You better do that with both hands. We practice doing that, but doing hip replacements on the left side. Now we don't. We bolted in Bang Yang, that was where we started. And that's probably the nicest rock there, much nicer rock than here actually, but very dirty. Back. We chose to go to Saizambun, which is a special zone, still closed off till today, so nobody can go. Nobody has ever climbed those routes there, but that was a special trip. Probably lost 10 kilos right there because the food was so horrid. Oh, the guy's in my inner ear now. No, I'm serious. I know. I'll get the ball out. Huh? What's wrong with that? Oh, those flies. They love going into all the possible holes. So the nose, the eyes, the ears, the mouth. He's stuck in there. Well, putting up roots is always difficult. The difficult part here is that you always start from the bottom. Bolting up is just very strenuous. It's very scary. I'm not that good of a track climber, so I'm not that skilled with friends and nuts and whatever. And um, of course, there's this aspect where there's no helicopter when something happens or no great hospital that can take care of you. Um, so I think there's always this fear aspect that is a bit stronger here than maybe in Europe. Oh, mama, don't let your babies grow up to be cowboys. Let them be doctors and lawyers and such. And then when you put up roots, you never know, right? Is this hold going to break? Is this going to stick? You know, is this tufa going to hold? And um, this is more pronounced here because you either have very strong rock that is just, you know, solid or you have those very strange structures. It's hard sometimes to tell which structure is going to be good and which isn't. She's thinking about a, a young patient who is at ICU at the moment and will come back for follow-up next week. Mm -hmm. 
Do all the doctors go to the morning meeting? Oh no, they just come if they want to. They should all come, but there's a lot, there's very little routine here. The doctors who were on call in the hospital, it's mostly the young doctors, they all come in the morning, but the, the older ones, the ones who run the departments, they show up as, as much as they want to or as much as they can because they all have their private clinic at their house and they need to do that to make money. So apparently if they have patients at their house, they work their clinic and then they come later. The problem is that there's so much, so little routine that everything is kind of like a mess so everybody does what he just thinks is important but there is no real structure on, on the daily routine. But now, they, but now, uh, the family I agree. Actually, one go home for okay. the nurse not allow. So he's 18 years old. He has a femur fracture. Um, is it open? Open fracture? No, 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 no. Not, not Close open class. fracture. Close. And the family does not agree for surgery, and they want to seek traditional Lao medicine, which consists mostly of herbal treatment. That's a problem you're facing all the time, that there is an indication for a surgery and then they actually, the family does not consent and they seek traditional Lao medicine, which is mostly shamanic medicine. I don't know. For this one? Yes. <laughs> no, that doesn't work at all. No. That's this guy? Yes. Oh, uh, they're, they're together here? Yeah, we cannot, we cannot do it. Okay, they're a family? Yes. For cool? Yes. Okay, so we have two brothers, so we forget that out. They look kind of similar, so they almost like look like twins. Fafet? No, no. Okay, no twins. But um, he has a tibia fracture and he has a majorly displaced femur fracture, and that has no way to do it with casting. That may even work. Not good, but may even work. But this is dislocated like four centimeters. There's no way. Can I do surgery? So if they don't consent on surgery, then actually the traditional Lao medicine will be no immobilization, just herbal treatment, which will very likely result in a non-union of the fracture. And then he'll, he will have a, a much worse problem than actually right now. So he will probably see him again now. So this is one of my most favorite tools here. It is not a laboratory as you would actually think it is, but it also not, it's not. They actually use it to clean out uh, stuff from the OR, basically to wash out the uh, blood clots and stuff like that. And you know, you might as well just use a toilet for that. It works. You even got a flush. Oh, yeah, it's leaking, of course. It's a, it's a loud hole. You need to have a second bucket just to collect the water, which is dripping out from somewhere. Oh, okay, let's go. Give me um um back 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 ne ah oxygen okay bang oxygen ma boy
Bumi 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 so the baby just um, had severe problems breathing. It started already the day before, when after he was born, um, he had what we call a respiratory distress syndrome. That's why we tried to help him with CPAP. But the pressure I can produce here, I don't really know how high it is, and so it wasn't sufficient. There's no surfactant in this country, so I couldn't help him. And um, so just a moment ago, um, he stopped breathing, having an apnea, and I started um, breathing for him with a mask. But his heart rate went down really, really fast, below 60, so we started CPR. And when I noticed that the heart rate had dropped so far, I called Sisupan to help me, and then we did the reanimation together. He did the breathing, and I did um, CPR. That is a hard moment to lose a child that is quite as mature. 31 or 32 weeks in Germany would probably survive. But he was severely sick already when he came to this world. And I think he probably, on top of being RDS, on top of being premature, he also had an infection, some kind of sepsis. Now, I have no way of knowing this because I can't check all the blood work that I can make home and I can't do an ultrasound. And I think it was okay for this child to go. Um, and Sisupan then suggested that we should stop CPR. And um, I agreed that, that probably didn't make any sense. There is no breathing apparatus here, no respirator. I cannot do anything for this child. If he doesn't breathe on his own, there's no way I can save this child. And what felt kind of strange is that then after a while, the, father, the grandfather came in and all he had to transport his child back home was a, um, a carton box um, where he put the child in and took him home. So for us, that feels kind of strange, and we look at it in a strange way, but he needs to bring him home. Um, they're going to um, put him on a fire and burn him as in a Buddhist ceremonial. And so it feels strange, but it's actually a normal way to go. And although Sisupan seemed very um, unemotional, I think that he must lose quite a lot of babies because we've been here only a week and we've already lost one. I think he must lose one every week or other week because there's no way he can save those premature babies. So I think his reaction might seem strange, but I can understand it and that's quite okay. Black femur. Cesarean section, sterilization, that's gynecology, and uh, gallbladder perforation. So, one thing in surgery which is different to Germany or all other countries we know is that the consent form here is not given by the patient but the family. So, the family is the only one to decide which is good for the patient. We're having this problem right now with this one patient where we would want to do surgery and the family needs to consult, so actually somebody needs to drive back home to the village, get some family consult together, and then the family gives us a decision. Some guy drives back with a motorbike and says, yes, you can go for surgery, or yes, this family is against that. If this is better or worse, well, it's different. In some cases, it's probably better than what we do back home. Sometimes it's really a pain in the ass. He has a cystic tumor of the distal femur, and my colleague did a biopsy last year, but we don't know about the result. And apparently, I don't know why no further treatment was done. Either he refused it or the biopsy wasn't too bad. Um, and now he has a malignant bone tumor, uh, which is uh, going to become an ulcer here. He's not made bearing on that leg for quite a while. And if you look at the if the x-ray, you can see a cystic tumor eating up all of the proximal tibia. And there's also already tumor infiltration in the distal femur. We don't have a staging, of course, of the patient here. Um, but the only way to proceed right now is to do an amputation of the upper leg. And then try to get a pathological workup of that stuff in the Chan and then see if we can send him for chemotherapy or something additionally to, to Thailand.
A lot of things changed. I think the medicine is developing really fast here. Um, also with the progress of internet and international teaching, the young doctors which are evolving right now have a broader knowledge, have more easy access to, to knowledge and, and, and literature, and they are eager to learn actually. So um, the, the system is developing fast. Just looking at trauma surgery, I started with a hand drill and an old drill machine left over from the Vietnam War and only external fixators for the first year. Now we do, uh, we think about arthroscopy next year. We do all major procedures, including spine surgery. We do hematoma evacuation inside the skull. So mostly everything is covered. As we can see now, those two patients from this morning with the femur fracture displaced and the tibia fracture, they were both went home getting traditional Lao medicine, which is really bad, but there's not much we can do about it. We'll wait and they will come back if they realize that they will not be walking again. This is more for the jungle ward. I think this is cooler. Or black one. It's supposed to be like this. But if you want to keep the flies away, I think it works like that. You still can see through it and be late. I would try that out. So we came here after work, which was a bit difficult because climbing stuff was still at the climbing camp. We went there and then the modern motorbike broke down. So we don't really know yet if we can go back with it or not. But we decided for the climbing and left the bike staying there. And I'm gonna go brushing the roots today and preparing them so that way we can actually try them on the next weekend. We got headlamps so we can work a little bit in the dark. Our adjusted belay outfit. So I'm using my nice jacket, which is a bit warm, but um, it's waterproof. Then we got the help 
hat we bought on the market that actually goes down and you can almost completely close it here and then eye sheds and then you're in a sauna and delaying but at least they're just here and there and only sometimes in here stupid fuckers So I'm just coming down from brushing. It's not very exciting, but it's kind of cool to do that in the jungle. You hear all the, the birds and you're surrounded by all those um, bats. They get really big, kind of scary. I mean, I've, uh, I did two moves of like eight hard moves, but the other ones I haven't brushed the holes uh, completely. So it's hard to figure out if they're gonna stay there or not. If it's a lot, you know, the, the the face itself is the white stuff and then they have this kind, kind of hard clay on it and if you brush too hard then or hammer it too hard then it just falls off and nothing's left over there but if you're not like kind of like trying it with the hammer then it will break off the moment you're actually holding on to it so it's difficult to say it may be impossible it may come down to a day I don't know So yesterday we had a child come in with cleft plate. Uh, a cleft plate is when he had the maximal form of a cleft, cleft plate. So not only the lips were not together, but also there was a complete opening towards the nose on both sides. I've never seen it that bad. But actually the child was doing pretty well. Um, however, on top of having the cleft plate, he was also too small for his age. He was probably 33 weeks old, um, but only he only weighed 1,100 gram. And on top of that, he um, he had a PDA, a persistent ductus arteriosus, which, which is a fetal circulation that kept being on after his birth. So actually everything was going great. He was saturating well, he was breathing on his own, he was doing really, really well. And a child like this in Germany, we probably would have sent after two or three days to get um, a plate adapted to the upper jaw. And then he probably would have been able to drink with a normal bottle. In Germany, we also have different bottles that are called Habermann bottles. And they can, when you have a cleft plate, you can actually feed babies with a cleft plate with this kind of bottle. They don't have that here. There's no way to feed a child with a cleft plate here. Um, although the nurses told me that sometimes they try to feed with a spoon. If it had only been that cleft plate, he probably would have had a good chance. But because he was so little, and on top of that had still this persistent fetal circulation, I was afraid to let him go. But his parents then this morning insisted, or his father and the rest of the family, insisted that they take him home. But I knew for sure that they wouldn't be able to feed him. And so I didn't want to let him go. And I asked Dr. Teng Mo, who came along to translate, and she did a very, very good job trying to persuade the parents and the family to leave the kid here so we could make him better. And then maybe take him home in two weeks. I was also prepared to pay for the hospital stay if that had been the problem, but the parents really wanted to take him home. And so I tried to involve the head of the department, which is Dr. Sisupan, so I went over and asked him to help maybe, and give us the chance to keep the baby here, or maybe give the kid up for adoption, or get him into an orphanage, so we would have the chance to treat him. But Dr. Sisupan said, there is no way you can take the child away from the parents. Um, that was very hard. It was very hard to accept that the parents would take this child home. And I, um, that kind of blew me, I think. It was, wasn't easy to take. We went to different guys trying to convince the Lao doctors to get more involved, but for them it's apparently, of course, it's, it's a daily sedation. That's what I have in 
or they're in trauma every time. Like every day that the patient has a fracture does not agree or the family does not agree for the surgery. It's mostly not that bad in my cases because well, they just go home, have pain, and then after two months they come back because they have a non-union of the fracture. Um, of course, here it's, it's a kid with no decision by itself and it's, it's gonna die because the parents don't want a kid with a cleft. That's, that's a blank truth. And I think you can only like go on that far and then we need to accept the system as bad as it is and carry on and try to help the next kid. So he's just trying to speak with the law doctor again now that they will actually try to explain the parents at least how they're gonna feed it with a cleft. But I don't know what actually will happen. It's always difficult to lose patients, but it depends, you know, like if, if the patient is 89 years old, well, he had a, has had a life. If it's a kid, which would have a chance here, then it's hard. I've just come back from my lunch break. The child is gone. And the nurse, which I really value, my best nurse here, told me that the cousin of the mother, so some kind of aunt, I guess, was willing to take the child to Vientian to the main hospital there in the hope that they would treat it faster than we could. Now, I don't think they can do anything that we can't, but if they're willing to do something that gives me some kind of hope that maybe something can be done for this child. I, and I try to not give up hope because the imagination of this child just dying is too hard to take for me. Yeah, it was, it was very difficult. Like first year, 1996 in Nung Prabang, you needed a police check every morning, every evening. There would have been no way for us to climb there. And in 2002, we got contact with Inti, my good law friend, who had a travel agency, so he did the permit deal. But then once you have the permit, you have the permit for an area. And you still, you, you go, you check out the cliffs, like here. We were spending two days just scouting. And then if you have a cliff, even if you have the permit, you gotta go to the village where it belongs to. You gotta speak with the village if it's okay for them to, 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 to bowl. You got to ask if there are pee, like ghosts living in caves, for example. If the cave has a little shrine or a temple, you may not be allowed to climb there. Or um, it may be bringing bad karma, bad fate to the village, so you sh you're not supposed to do it. That's a lot of stuff you need to respect, actually, before you can climb. So if you actually would ask me what I like mostly doing here, most people would think it's climbing, it's actually not. I, I mostly enjoy being with people, especially if the, I can speak a little bit, meet with my friends, and work-wise, like, I prefer... The doctoring is more fun, actually, than the climbing is. It surprised me, because I always thought that climbing would be my thing, but um, I prefer the work and secondary the climbing. If you work here, or you want to develop new things like climbing, you're gonna you're gonna need to adapt to the system. You don't need to lose your yourself or your own 
values or, or goals, but you need to adapt to the system and do a lot of things to allow it. And honestly speaking, like I could have not gotten anywhere where I'm here right now in work and also in pro uh, helping the progress of climbing without the help of my Lao friends. Mostly in T, I mean, he's constantly a backup if I'm stuck in conversations, if I need to negotiate stuff with the government. He's always there and he knows how to deal with them in a good way, in a respectable way. And, and, and has been a great, great help and friend. Well, I work on the neonatal care at the moment. And I think in Germany, a lot of the neonatal care we're providing goes a bit too far. I think babies born at 22 or 23 weeks are really not meant to live, maybe. We're doing a cesarean section for twin babies. Apparently they're on turn and we're gonna see how they come out. And sometimes it feels good here that if the baby can't make it, he can't make it. And I can do whatever I want, I won't make him survive because I don't have the means to do that. And in Germany I do. And so I make those children survive and sometimes I don't feel that's the best for the kid or the family or everything that stands alongside it. So sometimes I wish we could step back and have some of the medical aspects that we do have here, value the lives that we can save and give up on the lives we cannot save. I like that about here, um, that there's more nature calls, taking the reins and deciding where to go.